uh, we've heard a lot yesterday and also today about innovation. And we all agree, um, thank you. And we all agree that uh, innovation is important in cybersecurity. When I was flying to Ljubljana, I saw uh, a lady was sitting next to me on the plane and she was preparing a presentation. Um, she was apparently from pharmaceutical business. But I liked, I liked what I saw. So she said, on, her, on one of her slides, I saw it said, to stop the cancer, you have to spot the cancer. So I think it's the same in cybersecurity, right? To stop the attack, you have to spot the attack first. So, um, so, so what I'd like to speak about today is how to create or try to create an effective security operations uh, from a strategic perspective and maybe, if time allows, a little bit about operational things as well. Is this working? No. Nope. Yeah, this is... What can you do? This is working. So I, I came here a year ago and I spoke about intelligence-led security, not even uh, thinking what would happen in the next 12 months, because the world is changing and it's changing rapidly and the gravity of cybersecurity threats is growing rapidly as well. So what we've seen for the last, uh, how does, it's not working. It is now? Okay, I don't know what you did, but it is now, okay. Yeah, I, I did, I did press it. So, um, so last year we've seen a nation trying to influence elections in another country, right? We've seen a nation helping the robbers, uh, helping a crime unit to facilitate a steal from a bank of another country. We've also seen a nation turning off the light in their neighbor's country. And finally, we've seen uh, a malware, a disruptive malware that was masquerading uh, behind ransomware attack to cause economic disturbance. So these are the things that if you, if you had thought about it a year ago, you would think it's more like a James Bond movie that's dedicated to cyber terrorism, right? But it's not, it's actually happening um, it's actually happening right now. Now, how to, how to stay safe in such a dynamic environment? You need, to, you need to adapt. As we sit here, the Earth uh, moves around its, its x axis with 1,600 kilometers per hour. And it's rotating against, around the Sun with 100,000 kilometers per hour. So if you shoot a missile to the Moon, and you miss by one degree, you'll be off by 6,000 kilometers. So your strategic plan, if you want to be successful in shooting missiles to the moon, is to prepare um, a plan how to do it. And then operationally, be ready, because space is not, uh, is not really stable, right? It's full of changes and uncertainty. So you have to be able to navigate through those changes to ensure that you end up where you really want to be. And this is exactly what you would like to do with your cybersecurity operations. Now, how do you do that? First, you need to understand what are the threats that are relevant to you, specifically to you, right? Because there's no such thing as a common, as a common threat. So there's so much noise around us, there's technology all around us, so much data. And even if you find those signals, if you find these threats, how to prioritize them? You still have that mammoth number of, of things around you. Now, the answer is different, right? So if you're a Slovenian manufacturer versus uh, your Croatian bank or your Macedonian government, each threat presents a different risk for you. So you have to be able to determine what is really important to you, what keeps you up at night. Uh, we already know that if something keeps you awake at night, you can read the Tallinn 2.0 manual that Kakin recommended yesterday. 
But if you do have those threats, uh, you need to name them, you need to write them down, you need to enumerate them, and you need to prioritize them. Uh, the way you prioritize them, you see at the threat relevance to you, you play a scenario, what could happen, and then the you have the likelihood of whether it's going to happen or not. And if you take these two things, so if you take a threat relevance to you, and you take the likelihood of happening, you're making a risk-based security decision. And the stakes, you have to determine what's your value at risk, right? So, 2007, TJ Maxx breach. Um, so they announced they got breached. They closed the trading. The traders were trying to find out what's happening. There was a bit of panic in the market. So decide, they decided, so TJ Maxx, after five minutes, they said, okay, we're reopening it. So after five minutes, the delta of value was $54 million. That's a lot of money for five minutes. But if you look at the recent Equifax breach, the total cost of Equifax breach was $4.5 billion. So that's way more. And I think it's going to be, it's going to be growing. So you have to be, uh, uh, you have to be prepared. You have to know if you're vulnerable to these threats to play out scenarios. And you have to ask yourself a question, how much time do you spend on training? If I'm on the flight and there's a turbulence zone, I want to know that the pilot spent many hours in a simulator and he knows how to deal with it or it's a difficult landing, right? Does the same go for your security operations? How much time do you spend on exercising incident response procedures? Because when the attack happens, you need to be ready. So let's say we have this uh, risk profile, right? We, we've determined what are, the, what are the major threats. Now the next thing to do is to map your... Uh, sorry, there's something... Uh, so you have to prioritize your risk, right? You can't do everything at once. It's just not undoable. We bring your own device with con external contractors with so much data. You have to know what's important to you. You have countermeasure program that consists of various activities. Now you have to benchmark those activities against the real threats of your risk profile that you constructed. For the last couple of years, my observation is that the biggest threat to the organization is GDPR. That's your most dangerous adversary, which is not true, right? So, People benchmark themselves against compliance. People benchmark themselves against other companies in the same business. So if I'm a bank, sometimes it's more important to me how, I, how am I doing against my peer rather than am I effective against, potential, against the potential cyber attack. So the premise of intelligence-led security is to benchmark yourself against your adversary. That's your number one rule. Uh, it's, it's the absolute foundation of cyber risk management. And again, the alternative is just to protect against everything and then you'll fail, right? There is no question. Now, compliance, um, compliance way is also directionally effective, right? You can see it's the same direction. But the difference is, you save a lot of money by focusing on your adversaries rather than on your compliance. If there's, a, if there's a compliance regulation, let's say in banking industry, I don't know why I'm choosing banks today, but banking industry, and you're a commercial bank, or you can be an online bank, or you can be an investment bank, and depending on that, uh, you still have to be compliant, but your risk profile, threats to you, are significantly different. So I think especially as, I, I believe that the economy will go, will be tougher, and it will be more difficult to get money for security spendings, you need to find a way to close that gap. So to actually benchmark yourself against, uh, against real threats. Now, again, achieving effective security is a process. So we already have our cyber, 
our cyber threat profile, right? And we've already agreed, hopefully, that uh, we have to have countermeasures that tie strictly to your risk profile. And why is that? Well, do you think that hackers uh, have to be compliant with some regulation? Probably not. But do hackers know compliance regulations? Absolutely. So if you're compliant driven, everyone around will know what you're going to do, right? Again, it's directionally correct. You need data segmentation, you need encryption, you need IPS, but is it enough? No, it's not. And, uh, uh, and the example for that is a target breach. So compliance says that in the point of sale, I don't need to, need, I don't need to encrypt my data until it reaches the database, right? So yeah, now you have that, all that data in the clear. Now, if I have a memory scraping tool for the point of sale, I have your data. Are you compliant? Absolutely. Are you safe? Absolutely not. So make sure you benchmark against adversaries. By the way, I believe that FireEye is, I strongly believe that FireEye is a company that knows the most about adversaries. It has the deepest knowledge of, uh, of threats around the world, combining technology, combining intelligence, and combining incident response experience. So we can help you with that. Now, another step, next step is investment strategy. That's not easy, because you've already have, you already have 20 plus or 30 plus different technologies. So what you should do, what you could do, Think of it this way. Let's assume I have a, my entire security budget at hand. And then I have all my resources on the sideline, right, waiting. How would I construct my security, my cybersecurity infrastructure? Would I do it the same way that it's done now? Or mapping uh, cyber, uh, or benchmarking countermeasures against cyber threat profile, what do, would I do differently? And that what would I do differently is the first step to do the investment strategy for the future. Forget what you have now, at least in theory, at least for the project. You then may decide that you should leave most of the stuff. But just try to be clear of that and think, how would you do it in the ideal world? Then I believe the next step is to empower your, uh, your operations with intelligence. And it's very important that we distinguish between various levels of intelligence, right? Because I think that uh, uh, tactical intelligence, so IP addresses, machine-to-machine -machine information, you're already using that. So that gives you answer to what is attacking you. But you need answer also to the question who and why is trying to attack you. And for that you need operational intelligence. And on the top of that, you should also understand the trends in the industry. Understand what is happening, because then you can maybe foresee the future. So you need all these three, strategic, ta strategic tactical, and operational, to achieve the resilience. And by resilience, I mean you're ready 24-7 to what's going to happen. And what's most important, you're ready to accept that change it's just, it's the process. There's no such thing as a snapshot. Snapshot is not effective anymore. The world is changing all the time. Landscape is changing all the time. If you're not ready to accept that the change is there all the time, and if your infrastructure is not ready for that, then you're in yesterday's news. So I think we all agree that information is the foundation of every decision. Forget cybersecurity. If someone is going to college or choose university, they're going to choose the university based on certain criteria, right? Is it good for me? Is it interesting? What's the success ratio for students once they graduate? How easily they get a new job, right? What are, how does the campus look like? How, how do professors, are they smart or maybe they're not that smart? That's, that's the intel that people gather. The same goes for military, of course. Same goes for sports. Now, interesting fact. American Department of Defense 
spends 10% of their total resource on cyber intelligence, of 10% of their cybersecurity resource on cyber intelligence. Why? To make sure that when they spend the other 90%, it's spent effectively. Do you know what's the ratio in commercial organizations worldwide? It's two to three percent. Why? I have no idea. We're all in the same threat soup, right? Threats are, well, the relevance of threats is different for a different company, but we're all in the same cyber, um, cyber worlds. And there's one thing, one comment I want to make as far as sports, um, because I mentioned you need to have training, right? You need to have scenarios, you need to have your offensive and defensive playbooks. So if you see basketball players, we've seen guys dunking the ball uh, crazily yesterday. Um, so no matter if you're playing an offensive game or you're playing a defensive game, offensive game, playmaker gives the sign, right? Zero, one, two, that's the play. And everybody knows what you're going to do. That's because they've trained it 100 times. And the same goes for defense, right? If defense is not effective, they're changing the defense, but the coach really needs a few seconds to explain uh, uh, what they're changing and they'll know, they all know what they're going to do. So ideally in cybersecurity, you should be able to have these automated defensive playbooks just in case that something happens because remember, breaches are inevitable, right? So, why is, it, uh, why is it difficult? Uh, this is really a quick slide. It's a no-brainer. I think Gaking spoke about it yesterday. Uh, average time to discover a breach. Actually, for Europe, it's over 100 days. 102 or 103 days. 50% of it from, is from the external source. So one in two times, you don't even know. Somebody else tells you that you're breached. You have too many tools, right? Because there was a time, it's not... Not now, and fortunately, but there was a time a few years ago or 10 years ago where people would buy all these new, cool, exciting technologies and then just uh, be overwhelmed with the number of alerts, right? And then spend too much time triaging those alerts, right? So these are all the challenges. And then if you have so much work, then your response to a breach takes a hell of a time, too long. Don't mind the cost of a breach. We know it's rising. You know, it's probably not four million for, for our region but I think we agree that it's more and more dangerous because it's not only about technology, it's not only about laptop that's encrypted and you have to spend some time to get it back to work, right? It's, uh, it's also the stock price, it's also your reputation in the market. These are things that are very, very valuable. So, Gartner actually says we recognize the problem. So we think that the problem should be addressed by the solution called security, or group of solutions called security orchestration, automation, and response. Why is that? To improve visibility, right? To find that needle in a haystack. To speed up the process. It's 32 days to respond to a breach is too much. And to lower the cost. That's obvious. Uh, so I'm not know, I don't know how much, I have a few minutes left. Right, Chris? Yeah, six. Six minutes, okay. I want to tell you a little bit about uh, a new FireEye solution. It's called Helix. Has anyone heard of FireEye Helix in the audience? I know you have, because, and I know you have. <laughs> anyone not from FireEye has heard it? No. Okay, that's probably good, because this is the first time you hear it. So what we did, as you know, or as FireEye customers know, we have this large, huge database of information that flows from MVX-based appliances, so network and email appliances that send information about malware to the cloud and then they download information about malware to the appliance, right? And it's 16 million virtual sensors worldwide. They collect, there's tons of data. The second part, EyeSight, which is our intelligence part of the company, has over 300 analysts over the world to analyze adversaries, to analyze threat actors, to understand what they do, how they do it. And the third part, Mandiant, are experienced people in incident response. Hakim, you said one million hours per, per, per year. One million incident response hours per year. 
So that's experience in incident response, but that's also creating meaningful IOCs, right? So there is it's, there's so much data, there's no way you can combine it on a, on a device, right, on premise. So you have to use the cloud. If you're afraid of the cloud, I might have good news for you, uh, just maybe on the last slide. But if you're not, just think about it like this. It's a, it's a big cloud of information with powerful correlation engine. So if you send your logs, your FireEye logs, or third-party logs, so firewall, antivirus, proxy, anti-spam, you collect the logs and you send them together with FireEye logs, or if you're not a FireEye customer, just those logs, we correlate them for you and we tell you what's important, right? So out of 2,000 logs, we will find four, five meaningful incidents. But more importantly, we will also tell you or advise you based on severity, based on what we've seen in our database, what to do with it next, right? How to automate it. Is it an inbox abuse playbook, uh, intelligence enrichment playbook, or endpoint containment automation? We can help you do that, right? We do have APIs for you to work with over 160 different security solutions that you probably might have. We can help you orchestrate it. Uh, uh, we can have a role-based access control, depending on the role of your organization. And good news is this, if you are a FireEye customer, or you are planning to be a FireEye customer, and if you buy, and if you're within what US calls SMBs, <laughs> up to 2,000 uh, uh, endpoints, then you can buy a suite of products, network, email, and endpoint, and you'll get Helix for free. Right, so um, now for those of you who for various, re for various reasons cannot use the cloud, I cannot say, I cannot say that, because uh, I'm not able to speak about future uh, products and solutions, but we are wait working for an on-premise um, solution. It will probably be not as powerful as the cloud. There's no way to incorporate as much data in the cloud as we can incorporate, uh, uh, we could incorporate in an on-premise device. But uh, I think we do, have a we do have a technical booth. We have our um, SE here. If you find that Helix might be something of interest to you, please reach out. Uh, I really like the way data is presented there. It's fast, it's clear. Uh, uh, it really shows you what you want to see. And I think that based on Helix, you're able to make an information-based decision, which is uh, nowadays very important. And I think that that concludes my presentation. So thank you very much. Thank you for sticking with me and hope to see you soon.